everyone and very welcome to the school's cat day. Um, it's wonderful to see all of you so early in the morning. Um, I, I trust that you will, will find the session very, very interesting and be happy that you got up this early. Um, so firstly, what is this course cafe? It's a, it's a regular events um, hosted by the Friedrich von Sydenham Summit Leadership Institute, which is aimed at stimulating critical thinking and discussion on campus. And um, and I think this particular discourse cafe, which is themed around Mandela Day, um, will, will really <coughs> fulfil that purpose. And will today we'll think critically about Mandela's legacy with the aid of our very esteemed speaker, Sean Johnson. Welcome, Sean. Um, Sean is the founding chief executive of the Mandela Rhodes Foundation, and um, through which he and his team uh, better leadership in South Africa. And we've, we're happy to have a few Mandela Rhodes scholars with us today as well. And um, yeah, I just want to read you a by now famous quote that Mr. Mandela himself um, had to say on Sean. He said that, Sean, as a journalist and a public intellectual, contributed enormous, enormously to the attainment and consoli consolidation of democracy in our country. And yeah, I think we're very privileged to have him here today. Um, firstly, because I want him to do most of the talking, of course, um, I'm going to show a video that he's brought along, um, which he says is footage of Mr. Mandela, which hasn't been seen publicly, publicly of him interacting with the Mandela Road scholars. So, um, yes, let's watch that first. creation of this new partnership and a new foundation, the Mandela Rhodes Foundation, designed to support human resource development in South Africa in particular and more generally on the African continent. The toast is to Mr. Mandela, to the new Mandela Rhodes Foundation and to the Renaissance of Africa. By combining our name to that of Cecil John Rhodes in this initiative is to signal a closing of the circle and a coming together of two strands in our history as we move forward to build a better life. Introduce Nelson Mandela, what a concept. It is that spirit of our constitution that we tonight pay tribute to the work done in the memory of Cecil John Rhodes through the Rhodes Trust and that we take such pride in the establishment of the new Mandela Rhodes Foundation. have had the honor of setting up a new foundation linked to the name and the personality and the support of the man who more than anybody else symbolizes the new South Africa, Mr. Mandela.
It is therefore altogether fitting that we celebrate this 100th anniversary of Rhodes' gift to us with another visionary effort that will reach beyond our own mortality. The Mandela Rhodes Foundation will bring some of Rhodes' wealth back to its origins to help build the new South Africa. It's an extraordinary phrase to conjure with, isn't it? The Mandela Rhodes Trust. Those two names united together. When I think of the unity of these two people, Nelson Mandela and Cecil Rhodes, I think of Africa, its future, its place in the world. The importance we attach to the initiative is, we hope, reflected in the stature and quality we chose to partner with those nominated by the Rhodes Trust. Professor Jabulo Ndebele is a prominent South African writer and scholar. Jabulo, just stand up for them to see you. <clears throat> Good. Thank you. Thank you. He was pro vice chancellor of the National University of Lesotho, deputy vice chancellor of the University of the Western Cape, vice chancellor at the University of the North, and is currently the vice chancellor of the University of Cape Town, with which Rhodes has a strong historical ties. We are also pleased to announce the recent appointment as Executive Director of the Mandela Rhodes Foundation of Mr. Sean Johnson. Sean Johnson is himself a Rhodes Scholar and a young South African who, as a journalist and public intellectual, contributed enormously to the attainment and consolidation of democracy in our country. We are looking forward with great confidence to him building the new foundation into an organization that will, in its field, achieve as much as the road trust has done over the last 100 years. Words <laughs> of Thank you. Thank you. We are looking forward with great confidence building the new foundation into an organization that will, in its field, substantively contribute to a better life for the people of South Africa and further abroad on the African continent. at seven. It's what young people's dreams are made of. Landing a scholarship, getting through their studies with flying colors and meeting a world icon. Well, for the first beneficiaries of the Mandela Rhodes Foundation, this was no dream. I can't describe how amazing it is yet. I really can't describe it. The words just can't come. No, I'll tell you about it, but... Former President Nelson Mandela has passed on the torch of his leadership legacy. Eight top performing students have qualified for the Mandela Rhodes Scholarship. The eight Mandela Rhodes Scholars are from four institutions around the Western Cape. They are the first of what promises to be a prestigious community of African leaders. 
the students were put through their paces and had to prove themselves capable of accepting the responsibility that comes with the award, using their education to improve the lives of Africans. We want this to be an African program. just to say that this is an historic event for the Mandela Rhodes Foundation where we inaugurate this building as a permanent part of the Nelson Mandela legacy. Thank you very much indeed. That's a very important moment for Mandela Rhodes scholars. Can you come closer please? Can you come closer? Mandela, I just want to know, can you explain your emotions right now? How do you feel? Well, I see many young ladies here. Yeah. <laughs> confident that in another hundred years, others will gather here to triumphantly celebrate a centenary of work done by the Mandela Road Foundation. Nelson Mandela always knew where he came from and where he was heading. Today, he truly belongs to the world all of us for that legacy of making our world a better place for all, and particularly for the poor and marginalized. Let us rise to that challenge. Let us make of every day of our lives a Mandela Day, an opportunity to make a better life for some where we can. Good morning and thanks everybody uh, for sharing that, uh, that footage with us. Some of my scholars here have seen it before, but I think, uh, I think it bears, bears repeating. Are you able to hear me? Must I speak a bit louder? Perfect. Oh, fine. Okay. Well, thank, thanks very much. And I am uh, also extremely impressed with uh, you getting up at this time uh, in the middle of winter.
to, to, um, to uh, in favor of intellectual pursuits. Uh, when Emily uh, phoned, phoned me and asked me to do this, um, I said yes straight away. I wasn't uh, quite registering that I'd have to set my alarm at five uh, instead of rolling up under the duvet and drive through. But I've had a beautiful drive through to Stellenbosch, and I'm always really, really privileged to be able to speak about um, Mr. Mandela and what, and what he means. So um, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I had actually also, I was a contemporary of, of Emily's uh, father uh, at Oxford, where we both, uh, when we were very young, received Rhodes Scholarships uh, to Oxford. And that, for the rest of my life, has been a defining experience. And one of the main reasons why I feel so privileged to do the work that I do, because I know what an opportunity like this can do uh, in terms of, of, of opening up one's life possibility. And I got my Rhodes Scholarship at the age of 21. I'd never been on an aeroplane. Uh, I'd never been out of South Africa. Uh, I was actually born in the Trans Sky, which is not exactly a metropolis. Um, and so it, uh, I know what a, a leadership scholarship of this sort can do uh, for people, and that's why we are so, so committed to this. And I thought, let me rather show you a, a bit of the footage than uh, me spend the first part talking about the foundation. You now know enough about the foundation. Let's talk about Mr. Mandela. What you will have, uh, have noticed, though, at the end, was, uh, and of course we didn't know that he was going, going to become suddenly ill and pass on, but I hope all of you know who Professor Jake Scadwell was uh, in the history of, of our country. Of course he was a lot younger than Mr. Mandela, but he passed away before him. But before he did, he, he recorded that message in our boardroom, which was collectively all of us, and there are many of us who worked uh, in work in the name of Mr. Mandela, but worked in, within the aegis of Mr. Mandela. And I was fortunate enough, I mean, absolutely blessed to spend 23 years of my life in close proximity, 13 of them working with Mr. Mandela and 10 of them working for him. Um, but there was an understanding from Jake's and from everybody around Madiba and Madiba himself that this legacy had to find a way of surviving without the man himself, without the corporeal person. Because you need to separate celebrity, and, and as you can see, at a certain point he was the, uh, you have Bill Clinton and all of these other people uh, following. I felt terribly proud to be South African uh, at, at that event in London where all the greatest celebrities in the world are clamoring to be with the, the greatest. But you need to separate celebrity from the meaning of a legacy. And he was very determined on that. And so just very briefly, Mr. Mandela, before he passed away, was very, very clear and left instructions that his three foundations, which are the Children's Fund based in Johannesburg, run by my colleague Bongim Cabela, the uh, Nelson Mandela Foundation and Center of Memory in Johannesburg, run by my colleague Sela Hatta, um, and the Mandela Rhodes Foundation, uh, which is his, his CAPE organization, would do three separate things that really mattered to him. And they would do these things in perpetuity. And this is the mandate that we were all given. Children's Fund dealing with issues of children and, and, and youth in particular, the uh, uh, Nelson Mandela Foundation dealing with matters of reconciliation and dialogue and memory, and the Mandela Rhodes Foundation with developing, helping to nurture and develop the next generations of excellent ethical African leaders. And so Jake Scarlett finished off at the end there by describing Mandela Day. And, um, We've been working on it for quite some time, and the idea was, and it's astonishing how it's taken off. And I think Emily, you've even linked today's event to to Mandela Day, is that he uh, we took it through the United Nations, etc. And the fact is that Nelson Mandela is uh, the only uh, recent statesperson in history who has an international day. Um, and it has just taken off all over the world, where uh, people. People focus for that day uh, on uh, doing doing things that, uh, that that are uplifting in a in a world that is particularly brutal uh, at the moment. Uh, people almost latch onto this 
uh, as, uh, as, as something to, to do that is more high-minded uh, each year. So people do their own thing. Everybody decides what they're going to do. One of our scholars, Johannes, is here today. Our scholars this year went and interacted uh, with, with people in old age home. From what I gather, uh, underprivileged old age home, and uh, from what I gather, I'm not sure whether the old people enjoyed it more or you guys. I believe we couldn't get you out of there, <laughs> which is great. But what is somber is the fact that Mandela Day, for the first time this year, took place without Mr. Mandela. Now, it is a fact, and, and I can tell you from having been very closely involved, that um, Nelson Mandela, the person, had not been involved in the day-to-day -day running of his foundations or in international uh, public affairs for some time, not surprising at the age uh, of, of 95. And so everybody, in a sense, uh, knew that the inevitable was coming. But uh, for me personally and a lot of other people, I can tell you that we still are processing uh, the, the actual fact of, uh, of his passing. Everything that happened was an absolute blur towards the, the end of, um, of 2013 in terms of uh, the, the worldwide attention and everything that happened. But the fact of his passing is very profound um, and makes certainly the legacy work more of a responsibility even than it was when, when he was around. But I wanted to make absolutely sure that we move um, to a two-way or many-way conversation um, as soon as possible because I know some of you will have lectures etc that you need to go to and I don't want to just make a speech I want you to ask me questions. Um, there's a phase in South Africa at the moment where people, including me, are sort of sitting down and saying, what is it that I was privileged enough and almost accidentally privileged enough to witness or to understand or to listen to or whatever in the life of this extraordinary man? Um, and how can I make sure that I share it as, uh, as, as much as possible? So I really enjoy um, being asked questions uh, uh, about him, uh, what he was actually like, uh, telling some, uh, some anecdotes. If there is time, and I'm sure my scholars have heard this before, but if there is time, do remind me to tell you about a flight from London Heathrow to Nice, where Nelson Mandela was turned into the um, cabin attendant. Okay, if that'll interest you. One of the things about Mandela, if people ask, uh, you know, what made him special, one can go on for a very, very long time, but I think you would have seen from that, uh, that video material that one of his weapons, and it's a weapon um, that he understood very well, it doesn't mean that it's insincere, but one of his weapons was humour and warmth which is something that um, not many people in, uh, in, in, in world politics, etc., can, can do and pull off. And so in many, many ways, Mandela would disarm his enemies by making them his friends. And they didn't even realize what was happening to them. It's an absolutely extraordinary gift uh, and talent that, that not everybody has. But in the short time, just to set down a couple of, of markers, is. I've been asked on a couple of occasions, if you had to, if you had only one minute, and you had to choose one thing that had stayed with you, um, having observed uh, this man over, over many, many years, um, what quality would you say set him apart from absolutely anybody else? And that quality, if I was forced to choose because I could give long list of them. That quality would be that he had the ability and the knack to make anybody who interacted with him, anybody, feel better about themselves by the end of that interaction and therefore walk out of the room wanting to be a better person. 
Now, that may sound simplistic, but it is highly unusual. It is extremely unusual. And so, as you can see in the in interactions with our scholars, when he was still well enough, it was a wonderful privilege for me to be able to take the scholars up to meet him and, and interact with him. In fact, that was filmed at my home. Um, each scholar walked away knowing that they had been part of quite a big group and everybody had spent only a few minutes with them, but really, really feeling that he got them and, uh, and that they meant something to him. And it's true, they did. And what he used to do uh, beforehand was we'd sit for a few minutes and he'd say, okay, so I'm going to see so and so now, tell me where, about them, where did they come from, what are they studying and whatever. He was very, very genuinely interested uh, in these young people who now bore his name. Um, and he also had a very, very strong belief that a generation of excellent leaders, and by the way, he, he uh, he was insistent that the Mandela Road scholarships benefit the whole of Africa, not just South Africa. And so while the majority of our scholars are South African, we're drawn from, at the moment, 18 different African countries. And uh, I'm in the process, scholars, of starting the long listing for the class of 2015. Um, and we've already had applications for the first time from countries that we haven't had applications from before, like um, Ethiopia, Sierra Leone and others, and that, that is a continental word of mouth happening, that's what's happening. Um, but so he was very, very interested uh, in how a generation of leaders could be encouraged and facilitated because he, he strongly did not believe, uh, and I think many people might agree that, that uh, this has been borne out, he strongly did not believe that South Africa could just rely on having a crop of leadership, and that's across the board, uh, this is not just in one party, but a crop of leaders who brought about what happened between 1990 and 1994, which was against all expectation and logic. Uh, it really was what you call deferred gratification uh, leadership. And he said, we can't just rely on this to happen as if we are so special that we're always going to get a crop of, of fantastic leaders. Well, I'm sure uh, we can say that we, we haven't necessarily had the, the quality of the Mandela years, um, I'm being diplomatic as you can hear, um, in the interim. But he had a very, very strong belief that if through the uh, Mandela Rhodes Foundation, we, with absolute integrity and real application, if we began to identify and then nurture these kinds of leaders, young leaders, then a leadership um, coterie would emerge, not just in South Africa, but across the, the continent, within a period of time. Now, we've been going for 10 years, and it's very exciting for me to begin to see this, this happening. And we're already beginning to see it happen. As my scholars know, um, my vision always for the foundation was that uh, in time, it will be owned and run by Mandela Road scholars, by the beneficiaries. And already, and Johannes knows this, is uh, one of our excellent young scholars who you would have seen on the screen from 2007, Judy Sikusa, is already on our selection committee and already facilitating our leadership workshops. Uh, Jacques Conradi from Stellenbosch, class of 2005, actuarial science, is now um, a senior person on our investment committee. And so we grew, we're involving and grooming uh, young, young leaders all the time. I have to tell you one anecdote though before my, my time runs out that was a, a classic example of, um, of Mr. Mandela's sense of humor, is that um, we have an active, um, and I've got very active members of it here, I think, uh, which I'm grateful for. We have an, an active alumni network called the Mandela Roads Community. Because we concentrate, uh, just to digress for a second, is we concentrate hugely on the quality of people that we source, on the quality of the experience that they have while they're with us as Mandela Road scholars, but then crucially also on helping to facilitate them having an impact afterwards. So that's not just the end of the experience and, and afterwards. Anyway, 
So we have this organization uh, that was originally called the Community of Mandela Road Scholars, it's now called the Mandela Roads Community. And it is a democratic, independent organization that has, has its own conference and, and, and leadership elections, etc. And so fantastically, in one year, our, uh, the chairperson of our uh, alumni uh, was a, a, well, they're all fabulous, but a fabulous young Mandela Road scholar by the name of Anton Boeta. And he came to the end of his very successful term, and I was at the conference. And uh, there were elections then for his replacement um, to take over as he retired and the new person came in. And the person who was elected was a fantastic uh, Mandela Road scholar by the name of Butle Zuma. And so when, I, when Mr. Mandela was still able to uh, you know, follow events, I used to go and he used to love hear, hearing the story. So I went to him and I sat in lounge in Houghton and I said to him, Madiba, well, the, the, the scholars have elected their new leadership. He says, oh, oh, who is the new leader? So I said, it's a Zuma. He says, he took over from a Boita. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the other way around. I meant to get it the other way around. It was Bushle Zuma and Anton Boita took over from, from Bushle Zuma. Um, and it was that sort of thing that he used to, it just used to show his, his sense of absolute inclusivity. Mandela, and it's something that I think is present among our Mandela Road scholars, not necessarily present in our political DNA and culture at the moment, is that the first question he would all, all ask himself when making political decisions, and he was a very tough politician, people should never forget that, a brilliant politician, his first question to himself would be, is this excluding anybody? And you can see through the decisions and the choices that he made, all along, these weren't accidental. He was sending signals of inclusivity all the time. And that I found uh, absolutely uh, extraordinary to watch, as he did it again and again and again. And it was sincere, he meant it. It wasn't always within his own ranks popular, because uh, he was saying, no, we, we cannot represent only this one, uh, one portion of the population. Uh, we have to share this out, and it was a very, very inclusive um, period. But Mandela, uh, I've, I've touched on this point, I wanted to make it again, is that by the end of his life, and this was a great joy to him and his family and everybody that loved him so much, he had become almost mythologized into uh, a, a grandfather figure. Uh, and, and he was lovely. I mean, I've been in places and watched around the world as the effect he has on young people, and he just, and he genuinely loved the youth, etc. But I think what this, uh, and he used to think this as well, is that this was a slight injustice to historical accuracy in, in the end, because he didn't become that avuncular, cuddly grandfather figure just by being that from the beginning. Uh, this was a man who was absolutely committed to his cause and fought it at the, at, at, as you know, at the risk of his life. And that's what gave him the ability and the credibility to evince this, this kind of kindness and, and generosity of spirit. But as uh, uh, F. Theodore Clark, who uh, uh, we, we see uh, quite often in his, the work of his foundation is congruent with ours, um, if he was with, uh, with us today, would tell you is um, anybody who tells you that Nelson Mandela didn't have a temper <laughs> doesn't know what they're talking about because in the early uh, in, in the early days these were uh, these were really tough decisions that brought us to where we are. But the extraordinary thing about Nelson Mandela is that he could make a tough decision uh, that affected his political opponent. But he could also make very, very tough decisions that affected his political supporters, and so was unafraid uh, in that way. That makes me, uh, I'll start wrapping up and, and hope to get to conversation, but it, it reminds me of something suddenly that I hadn't written down in my notes here, but that I wanted to share with you. Um, I was a student in, uh, in the early, uh, well, in the late 70s and early 80s, very fraught period in South African history. Um, 
Um, I, I did my first degrees at, um, at Rhodes University in Grahamstown, and then, as, as I said, was transported by getting this, uh, this scholarship. And I remember arriving in Oxford and going to a, a lecture by a very, very famous um, political scientist at the time. Uh, and huge lecture, this would have been 1982, so um, you were the most, uh, almost everyone in the room wouldn't have been born, but this was a very uh, fraught period in South Africa. We were running into, uh, we didn't know it, but we were running into the period of the states of emergency of, of the 1980s, uh, real uprisings, real struggle um, that led by the end of the 80s to the apartheid state beginning to weaken and negotiate. But anyway, I went to this lecture in 1982 in England, only South African in the room, and I watched this famous professor. He turned around, he wrote up on the, on the board, and he said, there are three absolutely intractable political situations in the modern world. Three. Intractable in the sense that one cannot see a resolution of them ever. And he wrote them down, uh, and in not, in not in a particular order, and he wrote them down, he said, the Middle East, two, Northern Ireland, three, South Africa. And somebody put their hand up and they said, of the three, which is the most intractable? And he said, South Africa. I felt very depressed, um, <laughs> having been involved as a student activist, etc. This kind of made us think, oh, you know, we're never going to see. Uh, we're never going to see things change, and that's why, uh, Johannes, you listened to uh, Cheryl Carolus and myself talking the other day from our generation's perspective. That is why people like us who really genuinely understand the challenges and the reverses that face this country at the moment, and they are enormous, and that there are a lot of things that I think could have been done a huge amount better, but. At no point do we allow people to say it was better then, because we were there, and it was not. It was a terrible, terrible situation to be in for everybody, and nobody should ever, ever forget that as we face our new challenges, which, um, as you will have known, uh, towards the end of his time, Mr. Mandela repeatedly said, needs to be handed on to younger generations. But I hope that you all noticed something as well in his conversation with one of our scholars. And he made this as a very pointed uh, remark, is he said, education is the essential qualification for leadership. Now, there are people who have the view uh, that you don't need to be clever. Uh, you don't need to be a clever, you don't need to be educated to be the leader. Well, that's the opinion uh, of, of Nelson Mandela. And I'd like to end off by saying that he had really great hope that the young intelligentsia of South Africa and Africa would begin to stand up again. Because once the brutal political struggle is over, you need the intellectuals. And intellectuals is not a word to be frightened of or ashamed of. It doesn't mean ivory tower. It means people who are committed enough to educating themselves to do what he did, which he always proudly said, is that in the history of UNISA, he took the longest to get his law degree of anybody ever, because there was a lot of other stuff going on. But he still got it, and he made absolutely sure that he got it. And it really pained him and angered him when there was an argument against education, against intellectualism, as being something privileged. He said, anybody can get it. If he, um, uh, a herd boy from the trans guy, could make it under his circumstances to get this, uh, this education, and then everybody should. I think it's, uh, my, my time is up. I'm really happy to take questions. I don't want to keep you from your breakfast. <laughs> to say, by the way, that the, the Francais Slavic connection, just explain it to me again, so it's through the, the, the centre. The, the, the centre, just the leadership of it. Okay. I, 
just uh, <coughs> want to say something uh, quickly about generations and how certain leaders can really, really genuinely help to nurture other leaders. Um, I was a huge admirer of Fred uh, of and Southern. And in 2000, and not 2000, so long ago, 1993, I went to him with a manuscript uh, of, a, of, of a potential book uh, called Strange Days Indeed. And I very um, uh, gingerly gave it to him because, you know, everyone's terrified of rejection. Uh, and said, if you like it, would you write a foreword? Um, which he, for the first edition in 1993, uh, did. So I've, I've always felt just such a, a warmth and gratitude towards him that uh, I'd just like to not acknowledge today that I'm, I'm thinking of him. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. Right, questions. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for the insightful discussion. I found it really interesting. Um, one of the quotes of Nelson Mandela that I saw in the video, um, we mentioned education and that being the, the qualification um, or the, the need qualification for leadership. leadership. Um, and I find it very sad in that today we actually pride ourselves in putting leaders in high positions without any education. And we actually pride ourselves in that. Um, and with me, young people going out of the country, um, the state of our education system at the moment, do we have future leaders that can take South Africa from where we are now to a better place? And will they stand up to the challenge? Well, that's what, why we go to work in the morning to the Mandela Roads Foundation. But the good news is that we are only one uh, of, of of these kinds of, of initiatives that are happening across the country. So just to go back to try and answer you the way that he would have answered you, is that he would have said that the, the young leaders are there, but they are not going to just naturally uh, uh, grow into, into their potential. We have to actually go out and facilitate it. And that's why we set up this. But I'm thinking off the top of my head, I don't know if people are familiar with the Alan Gray Orbis Foundation that is uh, literally de dealing with hundreds and even thousands uh, of, of young people. Um, the potential is, ab is, is absolutely there. I just wanted to say something about this. Uh, this interests me particularly, is that Man Mandela never, he wasn't stigmatizing the lack of education. He was stigmatizing the lack of a desire for education where what happened to us, and I, could, I don't want to bore you, but I could go into this, it was a very political thing that happened around Polokwane, uh, and it was partly a, 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 a reaction against then President Thabo Mbeki, where um, it suddenly became uh, a, almost a rallying cry to say, who are all these clever elite people with their, uh, with their fancy educations um, that you know, we want to take over? So, Mandela's point wasn't that you had to be absolutely privileged and get your PhD first time around, is you had to treasure knowledge and education and, and, and reading. And so I, I used to write a political columns on that, I don't think it was not good for your heart, but um, <laughs> I, if I were writing at the moment, I would really be fighting against this anti-intellectualism where people are saying, oh, the cleverest, you know, as if that's a, a, an insult. We need clevers. Uh, this continent needs clevers. Uh, one of the, you know, we have four principles at the MRF, education, reconciliation, <coughs> entrepreneurship, and leadership. To do those things, you have to be, you have to be educated. Whether you hold a PhD or not really is irrelevant. Um, but we need entrepreneurs. Why are entrepreneurs stigmatized on our continent? We need more entrepreneurs than any other continent so that we can compete with them properly. But uh, the, the talent is there, um, as my scholars will, will tell you, you, all you need to do to, when, if I get depressed about uh, uh, developments at national level, I go and stand in our boardroom at the Mandela Rhodes Foundation and I look around the walls at the hundreds of pictures of, uh, of potentially brilliant young leaders. John, speaking of Mandela's legacy, there's, sometimes there's 
something that um, I think both for me and most other people that really makes me, um, makes my blood boil is when Mandela's name and legacy is connected to an institution or something politically that I know that he wouldn't have st stood for. Um, so what do you think is the solution for that? How do you, as you explained clearly that he's a celebrity and his legacy needs to be separated, but how do we address this problem when people just connect um, uh, things that aren't connected with his own legacy to yeah. for a political gain? It's a very, uh, it's a very big topic and it's one that he thought about. So, um, when you are a, 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 well, let me not even just say celebrity, let me say the most famous human being on earth, he was for a while, and also the most beloved. Then you're dealing with a phenomenon that is, uh, that is not fully controllable. Um, and I'll, I'll get to an answer in a second. And also remember that around a figure such as that, there are constituencies that want a piece of him. Um, some of them with honorable aims and, uh, and others who simply want to cash in. Uh, so it's a very complicated situation. So if you think about it, uh, with, for, for Madiba, not in any particular order, but there's the party that he belonged to for his whole life. There's the United Nations, there's the international community, there's um, the family, and remember in his complicated life there were three different families. There's the charitable organizations, there's business, there's da 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 da. Um, so what he, what he felt was that what he could control and keep absolutely um, <coughs> clear and ethical was uh, the charitable side of things. So that he set up these three foundations and in part of the video that I showed you um, was his, what we called his retirement from retirement speech, because he kept on retiring and then not retiring. And, uh, and in this one he said, look, I've decided, whatever anyone tells you, when I'm gone, the three charitable legacy organizations that are doing the work that I gave them to do are the following, and the three CEOs are sitting here on the stage, it was me and Bobby and, and another one. So on that he dealt with it. What the, his party does really can't be legislated. Uh, one has to just hope for respect and dignity. And certainly what families do is, is family business. And so the charities need to say, look, we have been given this mandate and we will exercise this mandate with absolute integrity and perfect governance. My colleague Selo Hattam, who is CEO of the NMF in Joburg, has a tougher job than me because what he has to try to do, uh, and it's horrible being a policeman, and I must tell you, by the way, people often used to say to me, isn't it absolutely wonderful working, being one of the people that works for Nelson Mandela? And I said, of course it is. It's the, it was the most wonderful thing that you could dream of. But it is also sometimes the most terrible job in the world. I said, why? Because at some point or another, you are a gatekeeper who is saying no to people who want access for their own reasons. So, uh, just all read and make up your own mind about Zelda Lachranzi's book, but can you imagine her life where 90% of it was saying no to powerful people? Um, so, Sello's job, partly, well, he has lawyers doing it, is to try to, uh, to to stop the most crass commercial exploitation. Um, we ran a campaign, by the way, I don't know if many of we've wound it down now, but uh, we ran a campaign called 4664, which was um, Madiba's prison number. He was prisoner number 466, 1964. And this was mostly an HIV AIDS awareness campaign. And what we were trying to do was to move away from the image the face of Nelson Mandela putting on a product, you know, every time I see it on a product I just cringe you know, because I know he hated that. Um, and move away and use his prison number, for example. So we didn't use his face, we used his, an image of his hand, uh, etc. to do the good works. But I don't know if I'm answering you properly, but it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. People try, uh, they try their luck all the time. Um, you can't control it uh, fully but you can just try to keep some, some, some order. I'm just wondering, you were saying with how uh, uh, his party has been there and doesn't necessarily align with some of the principles he promoted. Um, did, he, did he make many comments about that uh, in, in his retirement when he was quite quiet? <coughs> his age and that sort of thing. But did he have 
have much to say. Um, he made, I think, a very, uh, and I'm just giving you my opinion now, because this is obviously a very sensitive area. He said publicly, uh, and it's on the record, you can go and find it, is that he would not desert his political roots. And I think anybody that knew him would understand that. I mean, you, you must remember that you're dealing with a man who by the time he came out of prison was nearly 70 years old. Um, and so what happened from there to the end of his life was actually just a portion of it. And so while I think you would know, although you would have been very young at the time, is that immediately after his presidency, he was still very active and he used to comment on issues much to the infuriation of, uh, of people who came, came after. And, um, but he took a, he took a decision, uh, and this again is on the record and public knowledge. I'm just thinking carefully because one mustn't um, betray confidences. And I, I have always had, along with my colleagues, an incredibly strong feeling that if you are privileged enough to be given privileged access, you better uh, you know, respect that and, and realize that you were serving a person, so you can't just be indiscreet about it. But what, uh, what is known is that his last political intervention, and it was a sensational one, was um, at the time of the invasion of Iraq, where he issued a public statement um, a very interesting statement if you go back to it, where he condemned uh, George W. Bush and Tony Blair in, in quite severe terms for the invasion of Iraq, which he regarded as internationally illegal, but reminded them that he had endorsed the invasion of Afghanistan, which had been approved by the UN. So, you know, it was a new, quite a nuanced thing. But he, what I think I can say without being indiscreet is that um, it was decided by himself, his family, his wife, his advisors, and his doctors that after that, because it caused a storm, as you can imagine, anything Mandela said, the whole world would listen to and react, that he should, not, he should now withdraw from making public comment. So that's a partial answer to you. Um, the second answer would be that uh, certainly he had, he, he had his own views uh, about developments, but in the last years of his life, those views would be shared only with, um, uh, from my experience, his wife and his very, very uh, oldest friends, such as Ahmed Kathrada. So he took a conscious decision. He also felt that he was no, and this is, this is true and admirable of him to realize it, is that he had got to an age where he couldn't actually engage in, in, in the cut and thrust of a debate. And so it's not helpful to get into it. I mean, he couldn't just go on TV and have a debate, uh, etc. So towards the end, um, no, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't making interventions. He used to, he had a very, uh, he was mad about newspapers. So old, older generation, I'm also older generation, I was mad about newspapers. The one thing that used to drive him nuts would be if his newspapers weren't brought to him in the morning because he wanted to keep up with everything. And the second thing, and this is just a, uh, an idiosyncrasy of his, was that he absolutely hated it if someone had read the newspaper before him and it had got messy. And so there was one famous thing which I think Zelda's put in her book where uh, early, he used to get up very early. And um, one of the security guards or something, not knowing the rules, had read his paper at the breakfast table. Zelda walked in and saw this messy paper and everyone went, oh my God, so they took it into the kitchen and ironed it. <laughs> <laughs> and funny old man's habits, but so he kept up with things. <coughs> Oh, the aeroplane and the bird. So, okay. um, this is a slightly different question, but it's a question of knowing what to do and leadership. Um, we look at our particularly gloomy times with like Israel Palestine. Yeah. It seems like no one knows what to do, and the debate is always around what to do. So, if you have any insights on you always seem to know what was the right thing to do and then be able to pursue it. How does that work? Yeah. 
um, the one thing that I would say to you about the gloominess of these times, and I think anyone, and you're obviously really interested in societal issues and where we are in a historical juncture, is everyone would know we're in a very serious time. Um, the situation in, uh, in Gaza and the situation uh, in, uh, in, in the Ukraine as two, as two examples um, are, are very serious issues which don't have Try to remember, there was a famous uh, uh, woman political scientist, I think Barbara Tuchman, in, in America, who um, said wars are the results of uh, a series of bad decisions. Uh, sorry, a series of misjudgments. So, what's happening at the moment is people are making judgments. Vladimir Putin is judging how much he can get away with. Uh, Barack Obama is judging. How far does he have to push, uh, or is it too risky? So these are human beings making judgments, and if they make the wrong ones, you, you know, you, you get a war. But what I wanted to say, just to contextualize it, is that we've been here before, um, and things do go in, in cycles. And I can tell you that uh, towards the, when was it, the 10th anniversary of democracy, about 2004, I can remember very, very clearly that there were also Know, very, very serious flashpoints, and at that stage, Mr. Mandela was still um, still slightly involved. And I actually wrote a long piece for a, the Independent newspaper in London, um, which argued that the reason, one of the reasons that Nelson Mandela, this person from a, a country at the southern tip of, of Africa, how did he become? How did it happen? You know, and it's so wonderful for Africa, but how did it happen that he? became the moral conscience of the world, over and above American presidents and all of that sort of thing. And it was because he had, at that time, become the only statesman who was speaking on a, on a higher plane, not just on the immediate interest. So I called the, the piece, The Icon Who Outgrew His Country, you can just Google it, it's on, uh, on Independent, where I think that in, in his own judgment, and one of the reasons that he was prepared to stand down after only one term as, um, as president of South Africa was that the world needed a voice that could speak from a slightly higher plane. Now, the thing about where we are now, and if you read the analysis particularly of what's going on, without taking any sides whatsoever, but if you read, read the analysis of what's going on in the Middle East, is that it's the lack of a person who has the power and the vision to impose it on their own uh, people, both in Israel and in Palestine. So at a certain point where Nelson Mandela stood up and he said, our civil war stops here. That takes, that's a huge risk, huge risk. And there were a lot of people within his own party who disagreed with him. And so he had to lay himself absolutely on the line. And that, I think, in, 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 particularly in the Middle East situation, is, is the biggest problem. It's not what to do, but does anybody have the power to impose whatever, whatever it is, whether it's a two-state solution or a one-state solution or, or, or whatever. So you get, there's a, there's a, a very uh, brilliant um, analysis at the moment, if you're interested in that situation, just come out, called My Promised Land by a, um, a liberal uh, Israeli journalist who argues exactly this, is that the scary thing in Israel, um, from his view, I'm not an expert, um, but is that, no, that nobody is powerful enough to actually take a decision. And so all you do is you, you go day by day, so, okay, what happened today? All well, these rockets came in, so send those in. You know, that's drifting towards disaster. And, and uh, Hamas is also in a very difficult situation. So what you don't have, and I had rather hoped that uh, uh, in, in earlier times that uh, a figure like Barack Obama or someone like that could become this you know, above it all figure. Um, at the moment, you don't have it. But don't ever make the mistake that I used to make, which was of thinking that the situation that my generation was seeing was the first time that it ever happened uh, in the world. Believe me, it's not. Um, and self-preservation does tend to kick in even at the uh, at the last minute. <coughs> back from the brick, I hope so.
Okay, can I tell my story? Okay. <laughs> so, um, after he uh, stepped down from the presidency uh, in 1989, um, we were still such an, a very, very new democracy. And so the state was not experienced in what you do with a former president because it didn't have any former democratic presidents. Um, and also a lot of people hadn't expected Mandela to go through with it because everyone then wanted him to stay on. So cut a long story short, you saw my, my friend, my late friend Jay Scarborough on the, uh, on the movie, is that when Madiba stepped down at the, at the end of 1999, Nothing was arranged for him. So can you imagine? You're president and the most famous person in the world on Friday. And on Saturday morning, you're answering your own phone. Um, so Jake's and, and others had to very hurriedly, because the state hadn't made arrangements, um, set up uh, uh, the Nelson Mandela <coughs> Foundation in Joburg, our sister organization, which was essentially a post-presidential office for Maniba, like you have for American presidents. Now, the reason for me telling you all of this is that they they then had to sort of build a little infrastructure and start making it up as they, they, as they went along. Now, because Mandela was so unpretentious, and he really, really was unpretentious, whereas other former heads of state, much less important than him, would travel around with their own private jets and entourages of 60 and, you know, all of this sort of thing, he just, you know, he, he, he would say um, to his assistants or Jake's or uh, any one of us or whatever, he said, I, I need to go to London. Now, can you imagine? He thinks it's easy to just, you know, transport the most famous person in the world because he wants to go and see someone in London, like the Queen. <laughs> but this is the way that he, that, that he thought. So why am I telling you all of that? And because it meant that he very often traveled um, commercial, on commercial airlines, which is just normally, you know. Um, which is wonder, a wonderful reflection on his lack of pretension, but an absolute nightmare for his entourage. Um, so when there wasn't a state plane available, or some, yeah, like Rupert or someone lending him a plane, uh, and we had to go somewhere, um, and uh, this brings me uh, to the story. 2000, and where were we? 2000, I think it was 2004. Um, he was doing quite a lot of fundraising for, uh, for the foundations and um, there was also a statue being opened in, in London. I can tell you at that stage there used to be hundreds and hundreds of requests every week from all over the world, from kings and queens and presidents and ordinary people and whatever for, for him to <coughs> come and attend something. It was a nightmare to, to manage. Anyway, so here's the story. It's that the Prince of Monaco, Prince Albert, had, was marrying or was getting married to a South African, Charlotte Weinstein. Okay. And so they put through a, a request that Madiba come to Monte Carlo and that they uh, do a joint charitable fundraising dinner in Monte Carlo, all very glamorous, lots of wonderful fam famous guests. Um, and that this raises funds for, uh, for, for the charities. Now that, that was all agreed to. Um, and so the logistics were that uh, he had to be got from uh, Joburg to London for the unveiling of the statue. British Airways, he went on British Airways um, and he would obviously sit at the front of the plane. Um, and the way that, you, that this used to work, and I used to love watching the dynamics of it, is that everybody would board the plane, um, they wouldn't know who was coming onto the plane, and then right just before it took off, I'm sure you've all seen it, is that there'd be that sort of lift that comes up on the side for people who, you know, who, need, who needed help, and um, that he would be brought onto the front of the plane. And of course the whole plane would, everyone would say, oh, now someone dad is on the plane, and everyone would be very excited, but it was all completely controlled, because he would then go and sit at the front, and, People were generally very respectful and he had one security guy. Anyway, so that's Joe to London, which all goes fine. Um, then when he was finished his business in London, his little entourage, including me, needed to go uh, to fly to Nice and then drive to, uh, to, to Monte Carlo, which is fairly, 
really close by. And to this day, I have no idea why this happened, but this is my story. Is that for the first time ever, instead of boarding all the passengers before, they boarded Mediva first. Now, this was not a, a jumbo jet. This was like a, 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 one of these um, BA flights, Comair flights that we would do between Cape Town and Joburg. So this is a little plane. This is a tiny little plane. Um, and so they board Mediva and Mrs. Michelle was with him. And so they're sitting in, I want you to picture this, sitting in 1A and 1B. And I think Zelda was 1C, I was 2A, whatever. So we're sitting there and then the plane is about to board. And we, we just realized this is the wrong way around. There's something, <laughs> something wrong here. And I actually said to Mrs. Michelle, do you realize what's about to happen? And she looked at me and she laughed when he was reading his newspaper. And um, she realized what was going on. Of course, normal Joes who are um, flying on business or holiday or whatever from London to Nice got their kids in their briefcase and whatever, and they come up the stairs and they're, up, and they're staring straight into the face of Nelson Mandela. <laughs> and I was just sitting around with him, and then we were just going, what, what is going to happen? And so he sort of looks up, and people are going, like that. And so he looks around and we see a twinkle in his eye. And without missing a beat, he stands up and he says, Welcome aboard. And he takes the boarding pass. And he says, 13B, enjoy your flight. <laughs> without missing a beat. So we were just collapsed laughing. Of course, everybody then real, you know, realized what was happening. And so all 200 passengers got boarded by Nelson Mandela. The captain of the uh, flight, the BA flight, comes on uh, much later and he says, ladies and gentlemen, I do apologize for the very long delay, but I'm quite confident for the first time in my flying career that there will be no complaints. <laughs> uh, and we took off about an hour and a half later and um, we just sat down and went back to his newspaper. So I thought that was a wonderful, uh, it's firstly the way he is. Oh, and he allowed everyone to have pictures taken with him and whatever. It's the way he is um, in, in, uh, in being unpretentious. Also appeals to his sense of humor because he liked his celebrity. Right? Make no mistake. He enjoyed it. He liked the, the fact that if he walked down the street in London or, or New York, that particularly young people would you know, all want to meet him and whatever. So, uh, he enjoyed it, but he also understood how to play it. That was brilliant. I mean, he won over, if he had to, if he needed to, 200 fans for life who will be telling the story the way I am. Um, and so there's something pretty, pretty special in that, so that's my, my aeroplane story. I kept the boarding passes for my daughter. <laughs> John, thank you so much. You can't say thank you enough. I think we'll start with an applause. <laughs> I'd like to hand this over to you. It's, uh, just a certificate saying that you are now an honorary member and fellow of the Frederick Stubbard Society Leadership Institute. Right. And we, <laughs> we hope to see you back. Thank you. <laughs> signed in. Um, if you haven't, please come and do that and um, you can have some more, more breakfast before you run off to class. And just so you know, um, the exhibition around us um, in the museum is on Nelson Mandela and Rosa Parks. And it's quite interesting. On that side, it's uh, art for democracy, 20 years of democracy. So um, all of it very interesting. So have a look at that. And um, while I have the opportunity, I'd like to welcome our Namibian students who are from the University of Namibia who have joined us and they'll be here for the rest of the week. Can I just say something? That if any of you who've given your names would like to be put on the Mandela Roads database, please indicate mm -hmm. to Emily, and then we'll just keep you in touch with, with what the Foundation's doing. Um, it may interest some of you to think about applying. And please speak to Sean further um, afterwards. And thank you again, Sean. Thanks so much.